Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, we will talk about my digital clapperboard. So, clapperboard is often used when doing filmmaking because you have two devices, one which is recording the video and another which is recording the audio. And you need some kind of way to synchronize the audio and video track. This is generally done using the clap here because the clap, you, you can see the clap on the video and on the sound there's a very sharp noise. Plus the video recorder often also has an audio track so it's very perfect to synchronize time. On top of that, I've added other features. I made it a bit more digital and it puts a lot more information. It shows which, normally you write down which scene and take it is, the producer and so on, the date. This is all done digitally now. We have the episode number, the scene number, the take number, the date, the time, the file number. So this is a number, but up, oh, let's open again. This is a number, but this is actually the number of the video recording, the file name, which is using the file name. Same happens on the audio. The audio recorded using numbers in the file names. And you can have two tracks, two video tracks and two audio tracks. You can also set the numbers. As you can see here, you can set, go up and down with the numbers. Or you can adjust the time. And also the last feature I've added is whenever it claps, it needs to be on, so you need to shake it so it goes on. As long as, it's, as you shake it, it will stay for 30 seconds. But the last feature is that it detects the clap. And here on the buzzer, I'm also morsing the scene and the take number. And this way, on the audio track, I can figure out even if these numbers are wrong or if I mix up the file names or whatever. On the audio track, I will be able to figure out which scene and take it is. On the video, it's pretty clear because you just have to use whatever is recorded on the video. So let's talk about this QVoodoo clapperboard, the digital clapperboard. For this project, we will use this new board, which I'm calling the core board. In the previous episode, you saw me using this board, which is called the blue pill, and it is based on an STM32F103. This is an ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller. We have here a running at 72 megahertz, and here we have the 8 megahertz crystal to have this one running at 72 megahertz. Here we have a 32.768 kilohertz crystal for the internal RTC real time clock. Here we have some jumpers so we can actually start the UART bootloader and flash this microcontroller over UART. There's a reset button. There's a micro USB connector because this supports natively USB. Then a power LED, a user LED, and here we have a serial wire debug connector so we can flash the chip, but we can also debug the chip using the, like you would do using JTAG. So seeing really every instruction, every register and so on. And on the back we have a lot of pins here we have a small low dropout voltage regulator and some passives. This board is quite similar because it uses the same microcontroller, the STM32F103. Here we find again the 8 MHz crystal, the real-time clock oscillator, the voltage regulator, the jumper to start the UART bootloader or jump directly to the application stored in the internal flash, the micro USB controller, we have a reset button and additionally we have a user button which can be quite useful if you want to trigger an event quite easily. Here we have the power LED, here we have the user LED and all the connections but what I found interesting on this board is that it offers a lot more connections to peripherals. For example here you have some dedicated pins and the right pins so you can directly connect an OLED or TFT screen. Similarly here you can directly connect the EF ESP8266 Wi-Fi module, which I've presented in a previous episode. Here you can connect the NRF24L01 radio transceiver, which I've also pre presented in a previous episode. Here you can connect a Bluetooth module or simply use the UART. So, and this is not finished yet. If you return the board, we can see we have even more connections. This is the OLED. And here the pins are arranged so that you can directly connect an Ethernet module. You also find additional footprints. Here you can connect 
uh, flash chip, here connect EEPROM. There are even the footprint for the two polar resistors, so you can speak I2C with the EEPROM. Here there is place for a battery, so you can power the backup domain of the microcontroller and have, for example, the real-time clock oscillator running even if there is no power. And there is even space for a micro SD card slot, so you can have plenty of flash. And on top of that we have mounting holes here, so you can fix the board really solidly on every surface, or fix the board at least. And what I also like is this connection here. So on top we have the serial wire debug, like for the other board, but just below it you have UART1. What this allows me to do is use this dongle. So this is flashed with the Blackmagic Pro firmware, and the Blackmagic Pro firmware allows you to provide, yeah, here you have a voltage to power the device, here you have serial wire debug pins, but additionally you directly have serial pins, so UART. This allows me to directly connect only this dongle, provide power, be able to flash over serial wire debug or UART, and debug over UART and serial wire debug just using this dongle and this board. This board costs, costs a bit more though. It costs $6 while this one costs even less than $105. But I still found it pretty interesting for all the co peripheral connections and this time for this project we will use this core board. On the clapper board I wanted to show the current date and time. This gives me an indication of when I did the recording. And I also want this to be accurate although the board has no power anymore. So it has to keep running counting the seconds or the, and then counting the time. Now this board already offers this functionality. Here we have a 32.768 kHz oscillator and this microcontroller offers a real-time clock peripheral which uses this oscillator to have quite accurate count, uh, second counting. So with this we could count the seconds and also we can connect a battery here which powers the backup domain and keeps this real-time clock oscillator running and the real-time clock functionality in the microcontroller running, even when there is no power here. So we would have everything we need. Despite of that, I decided to use this chip or this board here. This board is based around a DS1307, small integrated circuit, and it is here you see also a 32.768 kHz oscillator connected to this chip. This chip is also there just to count the seconds. It's a real-time clock chip. I use this for several reasons. First, I had one of the boards where the real-time clock oscillator was broken, it was damaged, so I wasn't able to use it for the real-time clock counting here. The other thing is that counting the seconds is quite nice, but I still want to count the year, the months, and the day. And having and this is not an easy task because, as you might know, some years have less days, sometimes they are leap seconds, um, and so on. Now you can still import a date library in the microcontroller, but this integrated circuit here already offers this functionality. You, it does count the seconds, but it also increments the time, and you can read out the dates from this chip. Also, I thought that because it was a dedicated real-time clock chip, it would be more precise than, uh, than what I would have on this microcontroller. But this really isn't the case. With this microcontroller, um, the timing per default is already very accurate, if not more accurate, but at least as accurate as this one. Plus, here there is a way to calibrate the real-time clock depending on the oscillator. So this can be a lot more accurate than this one, still. It is accurate enough and also had plenty of these boards laying around. And here we see also the battery, so it keeps counting when there's no power. So I had plenty of these boards laying around and I think in future projects I won't be able to use them because this microcontroller offers already all the functionalities. Now, to read out the values, the date and time, uh, we have to use the I2C protocol. We see the connections here and I think I didn't it's about the I2C protocol, so we'll have a quick look at it. Let's quickly talk about I2C, or also 
written I squared C and you can also even pronounce it I squared C. This is a communication protocol uh, for a bus. So when we talk about buses, it means that multiple devices are connected. There are two lines for this communication, for this communication method. And we have all devices connected to the same two lines. This is what we call a bus. So they're all connected to the same lines. One line is the clock, also named SCL. This synchronizes the communication and tells when to read for data because the other line is the data line. So the clock line will tell the devices when to read for the bits which are on the data line. Now, because they all share these two lines, we have to find a way so they don't talk all at the same time uh, to on, on these two lines L, there would be some interferences some and some chaos. So how this is organized is that we have one master and lots of slaves. Actually, you can even have multiple masters uh, by the way it is designed. But in this case, and in most of the cases, you will have one master and multiple slaves. The master starts the communication and will tell which slaves it wants to communicate. The lines here are connected through a pull-up resistor to, this is VCC, any voltage. So this is a pull-up resistor, meaning that if nobody is driving this line, this line will be high to VCC. And the same is done on the data line. Here we have also a pull-up resistor. Now it is an open collector way of transmitting data. Open collector is by how it's designed. So internally we have actually a transistor. So the attack. This is connected to ground and here we have an NPN transistor with here the collector. This is why open collector, here the emitter and here the base. And whenever the master wants to send, or any of the slaves wants to send some data, they just toggle the base and then this pulls the data line from high to low because of this ground connection here. The same applies to this one. You have a transistor here and whenever you toggle the base or whenever you change the base, you will pull the data line which is idle high to low. And this is how you just control the data. What this enables to do is that none of them is actually driving this data uh, high. And anyone, any of these devices can put the data low at any point. So the master will control the, will initiate the communication using these two lines here and tell which slaves is now allowed to talk. Now let's have a look at actually some data communication. Here we have the real-time clock module with the DS1307 chip, which is connected to the microcontroller board with these wires here. So on the back we have zero and five volts, well, ground and five volt to power this module. Then we have the two I2C lines, the clock and the data line, and the last cable which you see here is the square wave output. This chip can output a square wave with different frequencies. I've set it to one hertz, meaning that every second I will have a falling edge and I'm using it to synchronize and to count the seconds. So the LED which you see here is toggling every second and since I'm counting the seconds every 60 seconds or every minute, I am using the I2C line to actually get the date and the time out of this chip. I've also connected a logic analyzer just here and on the screen we have pulse view uh, which will trace actually what the logic analyzer can capture. So let's start the capture and have a look at how a real world I2C communication looks like. Here is the I2C traffic we've captured between the microcontroller and the RTC module. And we can have a closer look. So we see we have two lines, the data lines, which um, they are zero and one bits at some points, and then the clock line, which is very repetitive. And this is how you recognize a clock. On the bottom here, we have the I2C lines, which are already decoded, but we'll have a closer look at the um, traffic. So as we know, the two lines are idle high because of the pull-up resistors. And when a master wants to start the communication, it will pull the 
data line low while the clock line is high. This is known as a start condition. And this is what we also see here. This tells all the slaves, please start listening to the data because one master is sending data. Once the master sent the start condition, it can start, it will send the address, what we see here. The address are, is seven bits long and these seven bits are transmitted by the master. So how it happens is that when the clock is high, the bit is stable. So when the data line is high, this is a one bit. When the data line is low, like here, this is a zero bit. And when the clock is low, then the master is actually allowed to change the level of the data line to be able to select zero or one. So the master sends the seven bits and this is the address of the I2C device, of the I2C slave the master wants to select. So all slaves are listening to this address and only the one which has this address will respond. Um, each I2C device or I2C slave has actually an address. You can find it in the data sheet and very often on the pins you can select the, uh, you can change the last bits. In this case, our RTC module has address 68. And after the master sent the data bits, it will send what operation it wants to do, either a read or a write. In this case, it's a zero, meaning it's a write. After it sent the operation it wants to do, the master stops driving the SDA line. It will still continue driving the clock, as we can see here, but it doesn't drive the clock, the data line anymore. Now, the data line is driven by the slave and the slaves pulls it low to say that actually it got the message and it acknowledges this message. This tells us that the slave device with address 68 is on the bus and knows that we want to do a write operation. We see here that it is pulled low. It is hard to tell on the trace if it's the master or the slave which pulls the data line low because they are both talking on it. But if you look at the protocol, this is done by the slave. So after the master set the operation, it told it wants to write. So the slave stops, um, stops using the line, stops driving the data line. And this is actually what we see here. The high signal is because the slave stopped driving the data line. Now the master, because the clock is low, is again able to drive the data line. And because we want to write, now we're really sending data. So we, we selected a slave, we said we want to write, and now this, the master is again sending the bits, which is one byte here. And at the end of the byte, the slave again takes over and says, okay, I got this, I've sent an acknowledgement. At the end of the communication, we are sending again a start condition. So this is when the clock is high, we are driving data from high to low. Um, the same as we see in the beginning. It's, a, it's just that it's just called the start repeat because we are repeating the clock again. Now, we are restarting the communication, meaning that we have to reselect the master we want to talk to. And as we can see, the, master, the slaves we want to talk to. And as we can see, the master is selecting slave 68, but this time instead of uh, reading, of writing, it wants to read the bit one here. So this is acknowledged by the slave. And now the slave will actually output the bits because the master wants to read the data. So the slave is driving the data line and spitting out these bits. And the master is acknowledging it after every byte, it got all the eight bits. And as long as the master is acknowledging the whole byte, the slave will continue spitting out the bits. Um, eight bits at a time. So here we have eight bits, the master acknowledges, and again the slaves send the bits and so on until we meet the NAC, the not acknowledgement, and this is sent by the master to tell the slave, stop sending me data, I've read enough of the data. So no need to send anymore. And at the end we have a stop condition simply by having the data line 
going from low to high while the clock is high. That's I2C communication. And this way we've actually read the, the time from the RTC module. And if we enable actually the decoder for the DS1307, we see simply that here we've read the time. Simply we've, in the beginning we selected the address to, to say we want to read data starting, starting at address 00. zero. And afterwards, we start reading the data. So here, the slave sends the data starting at address 00, zero one byte at a time. The first byte includes the seconds. The second, uh, here we see 16 corresponds to 16. Then we have the minutes, 42 corresponds to 42. The hours, the day of the week, the date, so the day of the month. Here we have the month and the year. And yeah. Um, which which register or which memory location which is selected here corresponds to which data is simply provided in the data sheet of the i2c slave and in this case the ds1307 tells that you can start reading the data um, that the date and the time is at address 00 the next thing we need to have is some kind of way to display the actual date and time but also the current scene, the current take, and the audio and video file numbers. And for that I decided to use seven segment displays. They are called seven segments because as you can see here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven segments plus the dot here. But you can represent any digit with seven segments and this is really ideal because we only need to show numbers. That's, that there's no more information. And for that, seven segment displays are quite good because they are um, they are very simple and they are very bright. So they are they perfectly match the purpose. Seven segment displays are basically just LEDs, and you can power on each individual segment, which is a separate LED, as you can see here. And we, here we have the dot. On the other side, we have the other segments, and some seven segment digits have a common anode, others have a common cathode, it really depends, so you have to look at the data sheet. But each pin is just one, each segment is just one LED. So when you only have one digit using a seven segment display, you have seven LEDs that's easily controllable using GPIOs. But when you have two digits, you have two seven segment displays, it means that there are 14 LEDs and this becomes tricky if you want to control all LEDs individually because you already need 14 GPIOs. And when you have 44 digits, like on the clapperboard, then you would need 308 GPIOs to control all digits individually. And this is not feasible. One way around it is called multiplexing. And the simplest solution or the simplest method is to connect all segments from each digit together, meaning that this segment is connected to this segment, this segment is connected to this segment, and so on. But I only control one digit at a time. So here I'm controlling the first digit, and I can set the segments to display the number I want, and then I can switch which of the digits or seven segment displays I want to display. And if you do it fast enough, then sense strength to the persistence of vision, you will not see that it changes between the seven segment displays. You will only see, for example, here 55, which is quite dim because I'm only powering through the GPIO pins, but it's not visible anymore that it's changing between the displays. And this considerably reduces the amount of, um, of lines you need to use because here we, are, we have only seven lines to control the seven segments the digits and then we have one line which are these ones which control each digit so whenever you have to add one digit you just add one additional line this is still too much because we have 44 digits meaning we would have just 44 lines to control each individual digit instead of controlling each seven segment display yourself you can use dedicated chips which perform this task quite well. And like here, there is a board which a four digit seven segment display dedicated to control the clock because here we have a 
double point in the middle. And on the back, you will see that it uses a Titan TM1337. And this chip basically just does what we've explained to control each of the LEDs. But what's good on here is that you just need to provide power using VCC and ground. And you can control what is displayed using just two pins, the clock and the digital input output. And this is to control four digits. This is the datasheet for the Titan TM1637. And this chip can actually be used for two purposes. Either you use it as display mode, for example, to drive seven segment displays or seven segment plus one segment being the dot. Or you can use it actually as a keyboard scan and instead of reading the seven segments, you just, uh, instead of writing the seven segments, you just read what's on the pin. And here it says that it is a two wire serial interface, just using clock and data input output pins. Here we have an example actually on how to use it to read the state of switches. Here we have the two lines, data input outputs and the clock line to synchronize the data input output or to know when to pass the data. If we look at the protocol here, we see how it works. Um, clock is idling high and whenever you want to start communication, you have a falling edge on the data input output line. And afterwards, every, uh, if you want to send bits, you set it when it is low. So this is when you can set it and when it is high, it should be stable, being a one or a zero, depending on if you want to write a one or if you want to write a zero. And after eight bit, we have here the acknowledgement bit, which should be low when this is high. And then we can continue sending other 8-bit bytes and always have the acknowledgement. And to end the communication, you need a high clock and to change the data input output, or at least to have a rising edge on the data input output line. And this should remind you of something we've seen previously, something like I2C maybe? This is exactly the same protocol or the way to send data over these two lines. But there are quite some differences and it is even mentioned here that it is not equal to the I2C bus protocol because it has no slave address. This is one of the aspects. Um, this two wire serial line is not a bus, meaning you cannot connect multiple of these TM1637 on these two lines. You only can connect one. This is also the reason why you don't have to select a slave address because you only have one device. So there's no way, there's no purpose or there's no need to select which device you want to talk to. Here we have even an example of the data you are sending. Here we, ha we are setting the data first and setting the data is described here. So for example, we are using the normal mode, then we are automatically using address adding, I'll come to that later, and then we want to write data to the register. So this would be the command. After the command, you are sending, setting the address, which is here. This tells which, which of the seven segment digits you want to actually control. And we are using address adding because once we've, so we are using this address in the beginning and afterwards we want to go to the next addresses. This is what we set here. So here we set the first address, then we sent the first, uh, the digit for the first seven segments, this way, then the second and so on. And then we can, and the third command is actually the control display control display is described here and most of the time you will have just a display on with the max brightness but you can use any below brightnesses the brightness is just using a uh, pulse width it is described here just using pulse width modulation now we are coming to this to the next problem and why it is not completely compatible with using i2c so we are writing one byte first instead of selecting the uh, the slave using the slave address and then sending the data. The problem is with this command here. Normally, the first byte is to select the slave using seven bits and the, then the last bit tells if you want to write or to read data. And the issue is here. Normally, if you want to 
write data, you have to end with a zero, being the least significant bit should be a zero. Yep, sorry. The least significant bit should be a zero, like here. Now the problem is this with this least significant bit. Normally, it I to C, you are sending the most significant bit first, and the least significant bit will be the eighth bit. Now with this chip, this is the reverse, and it isn't described anywhere on the data sheet and it took me a bit of time to understand why actually I wasn't able to send any data. But for this chip, the least significant bit is the first one. Oh, sorry, the first one. And the most significant bit is the eighth bit you are sending. This is not described here, for example, in the command, which is the first or, or the last one. So the issue with here is that this will be the least, the last bit, so the eighth bit you are sending. And whenever you are using the STM32 I2C peripheral, if you are using uh, the bit one as the last bit for the first I2C command, it will switch to the read mode, meaning that you will only be able to read bits afterwards on the line. You, will, you won't be able to set any data bits. So you, we cannot use the STM32 I2C peripheral to send data because it is not completely I2C compatible. And we've seen why it is not I2C compatible and why we can re not reuse it. Another difference compared to I2C is the way the lines are driven. In I2C, you have pull up resistor to pull the data and the clock line high, and this is the idle state. And whenever the master or the slaves want to transmit a zero bit, they just pull it low using the open collector mode. Now, this doesn't work with the TM1637. As we can see here, I've used just the internal pull-up resistor, I think it's one mega ohm on the STM32, and you can see that whenever I am not pulling it low, it takes a lot of time to go high again. This is because of the capacitance of the data and clock line of the TM1637 chip. On yellow, we have the data input output line, and on green, we have the clock line, and you can see the clock line does not have enough time to recover before the next clock cycles again. So to try to circumvent this, I tried also a 10 kilo ohm resistor, which is a quite usual value for I2C. And you can see even that with this pull-up resistor, the clock line doesn't have enough time to recover. Same thing with a 1 kilo ohm. It is a bit better, but you can see that the data and the clock line don't have enough time. And if you use a too strong pull-up resistor, like here I've used a 68 ohm pull-up resistor, I think, then the STM32 doesn't have um, strong enough open co uh, collector mode so it can pull the data or clock line low again. So it tries here to pull the data line low again but it, you see it is failing at it. So this is too strong. Another way would be to just give more time to the data and clock line to recover. And here I've set it to less than 100 kilohertz and you can see then even here there is barely enough time to have a clean enough signal. And this is just with 100 kilohertz. This is the slow mode or the normal mode of I2C. And the TM1637 can be driven up to 400 kilohertz on the clock line. So you can see this is not doable. The other way around would be to change the mode. So you're not using the open collector mode, but to use a push-pull mode where the chip is really driving the pins. This is what we can see here. And here we see that the signals are really clean. The issue is that with the push-pull mode using the I2C peripheral is on the acknowledgement bit. Normally in the acknowledgement bit, the master of the STM32 lets the signal go high and waits until or expects that the slave will pull it low. And we can see here that it is trying to pulling it high actually because we're in push-pull mode boys. so it is trying to pulling it really hard high and then the ship the T1637 is not strong enough to pull it low so because the STM32 is driving it high so this is not a clean protocol sadly because of that we cannot use the I2C peripheral we have to re-implement and do bit banging so we have to re-implement the very similar to I2C protocol but using push-pull mode and then switching to read the inputs on the ninth bit. 
Um, this is what I implemented and it works quite nice as you can see here and this is a more detailed view. Now the microcontroller can read the time from the real-time clock module and then display it on one of these four digits. Seven segment displays. Here we have the minutes and the seconds. And to be able to control multiple of this display, I'm using a 16 channel analog multiplexer. What this allows you to do is that you put the signal in here and then using this four lines here you can select on which of these 16 outputs the signal which is present on the signal pill will be forwarded to. And in this case I'm only using seven of these outputs because I have seven of these TM1637 displays so I just need three inputs. And I'm only multiplexing the clock and not the data line because the protocol allows this. I mean it's only passing um, bits whenever there's a clock signal. If there's just data signal, it's just beginning of a transaction, end of a transaction, and nothing happens. And this allows me to use just two pins plus the ones to, to control the multiplexer to control all seven of these TM1637 chips instead of having two pins per chip. Thanks to the analog multiplexer here, we are now able to control seven of these four digit seven segment displays which use the TM1637 chip. And we control them independently. As you can see, each of them has displays a different time. I also found these seven segment display modules and these come with already eight digits. It's really useful if you want to display the date and this is what I will use it to display the date and the time. But they're using a different chip instead of the TM1637. Here, they're using a MAX7219, probably because they have actually eight digits instead of just four digits. This is the data sheet for the MAX7219. And the first thing you have to notice is that this product or this chip is manufactured by Maxim Integrated. This is a quite large semiconductor manufacturer actually. And what you will notice is the quality of the data sheet. This is really good English. So you have all the documentation, you have all the information about the different commands, about the different bits. All the aspects are quite well explained. There is no open question. So if you're the one implementing the library to communicate with this peripheral, you're really happy about having such a good quality data sheet because for the TM, uh, 1637 from Titan, it took me a lot of time to debug because some details were not explained in the data sheet. Um, in this, everything is detailed. It was really a pleasure to implement it. So even if it costs a couple more cents, I'm happy to spend them and to have some good data sheet. And in this case, this is a good data sheet. But let's talk about this chip. So as you can see, this is this data sheet is actually for two chips, the 7219 and the 7221. The difference is that the 72 to one is actually fully compatible with SPI, QSPI or microwire. These are quite very similar protocol. So let's review first this protocol because this is well known. SPI or Serial Peripheral Interface is yet another common protocol used to, for communication or exchanging data between integrated circuits. And since we already talked about I2C, let's also talk about this one because it is very common. It's also a bus protocol, meaning that you can have multiple devices. And like with I2C, you have one master and multiple slaves. Here I'm only drawing two slaves, but you can have as many slaves as you want. Now, instead of having only two lines, like in I2C, SPI has three lines. And all the devices are connected to the three lines. One, two, three. The first line is the clock. Since this is a synchronous protocol, someone needs to provide a clock so every device know when to send some bits or when to flip change the bits. This is controlled by the master. So this is output by the master. Then the second line is the MOSI line, master output slave input. The name is quite clear. This is an output for the master and an input for the slaves. The clock also is an input for all the slaves. This is controlled by the master. The last line is MOSI line. This is master input, slave output. So in this case, master reads the data. 
And here you can see the first difference. In I2C, we have a half duplex protocol, meaning that first the master is sending and then the slave is replying if you want. Because here we have two lines, we can have the master and the slave sending data at the same time. This is called full duplex. You don't have to do that. You can still use SPI to do half duplex, meaning that the first the master is sending and then the slave is responding. But it is possible to have full duplex. Also, the clock is a bit different. Um, this is a bit more configurable. So SPI allows to prove, uh, allows to change a bit the parameter. It's not really well defined, or it's not. There is no one way to do a data change if it's on the rising edge, on the falling edge, and so on. This is configurable, but you can find it the data in the data sheet. Now, how do you select the slaves? Well, this is different than in I2C. You don't send an address over the line. Here you have a separate pin, which is called chip select, and it's negated because it is active low. This is controlled by the master, and the master will pull the chip select slow to the corresponding slaves it wants to talk to. And that's how you select the devices. This allows you also to connect a lot of the slaves without having to configure them and ensuring that they have a unique ID on the bus, since they just are controlled using the chip select. Another difference is the, actually the clock rate. There is no fixed clock rate. In I2C, there are two fixed values, but you can change them a bit, but the two normal values are 100 kilohertz, so this is the normal value. And then you have a fast transmission which is 400 kilohertz. In SPI, there is no fixed clock rate. Um, generally, they just specify a maximum, and very often you have clock rates to up to 10 megahertz or even higher than 10 megahertz. So you can see there is a huge speed increase. And this also shows what SPI is used for. It's not simply for sensor, this is really to transfer a lot of data really fast. So the per, um, SPI is very often used for flash or for any kind of device which produces a lot of data and you want to exchange a lot of data. I2C is slow data and it's only two wires everywhere. So it's less wires, it's easier to, to, to connect, but it's also a lot slower board rate. Now that we know what SPI is, let's come back to a data sheet. And we know that actually the MAX7221 is SPI compatible, why the other isn't. This is what's in this detailed description, you already find more information about this. So the MAX7221 is fully SPI, SPI compatible, while the other isn't. And the difference is actually told here in the serial addressing modes. But I'll uh, quickly explain it to do. It has to do with this pin here. For the SPI compatible version, you have, as we said, the chip select input, which is active low. For the one which is not fully SPI compatible, you have instead the load pin. The principle on how they used are quite different. Here we have a small diagram on the communication, which, which explains quite well how it works. So we have the clock line, or SCK, which is like for normal SPI, then we have the data in, which is actually MOSI, and we don't have any data out, so we don't have any MISO, because this is a display. We only want to send data on the display, and if it's not showing on the display, then we will recognize it. We don't want to have any feedback from the display. Now, for the SPI compatible versions, you have clock select, meaning that if you want to send data to this specific chip, you have to put it low. For the non-SPI compliant, you have load. You don't have to do this. What you do instead is at the end, you pulse the load line high. So whatever you send as data here will be loaded in the register when you pulse it. That's the main difference between both of them. This is how also you send data. So SPI allows you to send either six bits, oh sorry, eight bits or 16 bits. They chose the 16 bits variant because they need to send more data. Here you see the format. We have an address and a data field. We know what's the most significant and least significant bits. This is the address table. And you can either select the digit you want to send the data to. 
for example setting the segments or you can do some other things like setting which uh, which decode mode to use the intensity of the light shutting it down and so on and for each of these instructions you will find a table and a real good description on what you will do so normally we have these seven segments or actually the eight segments because we still have this dot here and this is if we don't use any decode so here we see no decode mode the data we are sending the eight bits we're sending just selects which of the segments we want to activate if you're using decode mode then it is a bit more intelligent because you're just sending the character which are defined here and it will immediately map it to which segment you want to enable so this allows you to have a simple way to send um, characters if you don't want to care about which segment is displayed here and here the other way uh, other commands setting the intensity setting which digit you want to talk to and each of the thing are quite well described so i really like this data sheet in normal spi you have individual chip select lines in this case as you can see here we only have one load data, but it is connected to both devices. So is the clock. As we know in SPI, this is a bus and they are all connected to all the clock lines. But as you can see here, the MOSI line or the data input is not connected to both chips here. It is only connected to one chip. And then there's an output which is connected to the other chip. How it is implemented is whenever you send 16 bits, Oh, sorry, 16 bits it will go to this device and if you continue sending 16 bits then they will be forwarded to this device and this will go here and only then when you pulse the load line these 16 bits will be loaded into the registers here and decoded and these one will be loaded inside here this way you can actually chain the devices so you have your microcontroller which is right here and up the first 7219, 7219, sorry, and the next sex and the next 7219 chip. So here will be the Mosi. Then you have back the load line, which are shared between both because you just shift the data through all the devices if you want to control all at once. And then you just toggle the, the load high or you pulse it high. So it actually loads the data you've shifted in all the devices. And obviously we still have the clock, which is also shared as CK, or in this case it's called clock. And that's really good design. So we've seen that on the using the TM1637, we had to use an analog multiplexer to be able to control multiple of them. Here we don't have to, we just daisy chain them and we just shift the data out. And while the TM1637 was only able to operate up to 400 kilohertz, this device operates at 10 megahertz. So this is like normal, some kind of unusual speed for SPI. This is really fast. So even if it takes a bit longer because you have to shift the data through, you can do it really fast because of the 10 megahertz. So this is a good design. I love this chip. I love the documentation. I love the way to daisy chain them. Now let's use it. And here we have the two eight digit seven segment displays connected. So they're connected here to the actually the real SPI peripheral of this microcontroller. So there's not a lot to do, just configure it and just throw the data. And here I'm using it to show the date. So here we have the year, the month, the day. This is the hour, the minutes, the seconds, and these are the frames. Um, so you can even synchronize on the, on the frame number. And since we've seen that we can daisy chain them, this is exactly what I do. And they already, these modules already provide the right connection. So it is, SPI is going in here, then it is going out and to the next one. And it's a pleasure to connect it this way. And with that, we have all the displays which we can control. We also want to have a way to control which numbers are displayed. And for that, I thought that the most appropriate method would be to use simply buttons. So we have two buttons per display. We have seven displays plus the time display. And the two buttons allow us to increment and decrement the number. And for the seconds, we also want to be able to increment and decrement the seconds to adjust the time because this small 
real-time clock will drift over time and we want to adjust it or to be able to adjust it. So if I'm pressing on the down button, you see I can decrement and on the up button I can increment and if I'm pushing on both buttons at the same time I'm disabling the number because for example I'm not using this number. And we can do that for displays individually. So we have two buttons per display. This means that we have 16 buttons, but I don't want to use 16 GPIOs because I don't have 16 remaining GPIOs. I'm, only, oh, I'm already using a lot of GPIOs. So the trick here we're using is the same that's used actually for the seven segment displays. We are multiplexing and do this is used for outputting here, but we can use the same trick for inputs. This is what you see here. We have four cables and four cables. With that, we are building a four by four matrix, which uh, corresponds to 16 numbers. And we are not using 16 pins, but four plus four, only eight pins. How it works here is that we are driving the columns. So this button is driving, uh, this one of the lines is driving this column. Th then we have the second column, the third column, and the fourth column. And these cables are reading the rows. So we have one row of four buttons, next row of four buttons, third row, and fourth row. And whenever I'm pressing on one of the four buttons here, then this row will be high. So the microcontroller will know that one of the four buttons which are, which are here has been pressed. But because using these cables, I can drive the columns separately, one of the another, I'm multiplexing and I'm switching. So it's driving this, co uh, this column, then the next column, then the third, then the fourth. And because I know exactly when I'm driving the column, whenever I'm pressing on one button, up, I know that exactly this button has been pressed because it's on this row and it's this column which is currently driven. And with that, we can uh, switch on and off. And if we switch off the power and switch on the power, we still see that the numbers are still the same because I s I'm saving then on the small E squared EEPROM, which is right here. So on the same E squared bus, we have the real-time clock and we have an EEPROM. And I'm reading and writing the values here all the times. So even if there is no power, they will be stored here and they will be remembered forever. Or at least for the lifetime of the EEPROM. The last button which you see here, which I've added, corresponds to the clap button. And what this does is that whenever I'm pressing, you hear a loud buzzing from this buzzer. So I'm driving using a PVM and its complementary output. And this is why this buzzer is really loud. And what it is outputting or what it is buzzing is the Morse code of the scene and the take. This allows me on the audio file to actually see which scene and take it is because the purpose of the clapper is to synchronize audio and video. So this is because when it claps, you can see on the video when it claps and on the audio track, you have a huge spike which tells you when the video uh, when the audio when the clap was on the audio file so you can synchronize the two files but you still want to be able to know which audio file corresponds to which video file this is why we have the numbers here and the file numbers so one file number will be for the video file the other file number will be for the audio file and the video can record this number so in the video you will see the numbers you will see the numbers of the file so you will have the number in the file name, but you will also see it in the video. And for example, if you just had the wrong file name or if you change the file name and the number has been vanished, you still have it here. Plus you have the scene and the take. This is, these are the two most important numbers. The same applies with the audio. In the audio, we want to be able to have a way to actually know which scene and take the audio track is currently. And this is what I'm buzzing the scene and the take because even if I did a wrong number on the display or even if I change the file name of the other track using the Morse code, I can still figure out which scene and which take this recording belongs to. So this is a good fallback solution. Plus, whenever I'm pressing on this button, 
actually you will see here that when I'm restarting the program, the number incremented because whenever I'm clapping, then I'm having one take and we're going to the next take. And I don't want to have to press on the button to go on the next take. This is why it is automatically incremented. It will also increment the video and the audio number. This is not implemented right now, but we know that it is working because the take is incremented. But the same will be done for the audio and video number. What we also want to have is some kind of power management. Because here, if I switch this board on, we see that we are throwing around 200 milliamps. And this is with not all the displays on. So what I did is implement some kind of timeout. And as you can see here, it is just five seconds for the example. But after five seconds, I'm switching off all the displays. And even the microcontroller here is switched off. But we can still see that when, as long as five volts are connected, the ICs are here powered, so we can still talk to them. Also, this microcontroller is powered by this board. And you can see the LED here on the back. So we're still showing 50 milliamps. And this is quite a lot, so if we would uh, connect it directly to the battery, after a couple of days the battery would be empty, so this is not good. We need to do something. For that I've constructed this small board here. It is connected to this power supply. We are still providing 5 volts. And the two elements, most important elements you can see, are this power transistor and this small sensor on the back. This is a tilt sensor. There's a spring um, on the outside and a center pin. So whenever there is activity or whenever I shake this sensor, the spring will make contact to the center pin and will allow power to go through very briefly. But this is enough time for the microcontroller to power up. So here, there was this small motion, this small shaking. The microcontroller has power and it is switched on fast enough so it can control this power transistor and keep the power running. And as you saw here, the displays are still running and we are using 400 milliamps. This is actually a more accurate measurement. And after five seconds, we are switching off. So the microcontroller is switching off the power transistor and now we are con using zero milliamps. As we can see here, zero milliamps on the multimeter, which is a bit more precise, zero milliamps. And even if I put it in the milliamps range, you can see zero milliamps and even zero microamps. So this system is drawing absolutely no power as long as it doesn't need to and we save the battery life. So only the internal discharge of the battery is now important. Also I am monitoring this switch so as long as there is some kind of shaking or in this case as I'm using the clapper board and moving it around this activity is detected and the microcontroller will keep the seven segment display is running. Five seconds after the last activity, in this case five seconds, but I think I will put it into 30 seconds, it switches off the power and we are using no power anymore. This is how this small power control circuit is working. In the input, we have a battery. This is just a USB battery because this is very common. They have an internal charging circuit for the lithium ion battery plus a built-in boost converter so it can provide 5 volts and the displays need actually these 5 volts plus we need ground. The ground is directly connected to the board but the 5 volts are not connected directly to the board because else it will show all the time some power. Instead we have here this small tilt switch or spring switch or yeah, which is then control connected to the board. So whenever here we are shaking the device, there will be some kind of contact and it will power very briefly the board. Then this switch will open again and because this switch will open again, we need some kind of way to keep the power running. And for that, we are using here a PNP transistor. This is the PNP transistor connected here and we are controlling it using a pin. Let's call it the power control pin because this is switching power on and on despite of what is on this switch here. Because here we have a transistor, we need two things. We need here a current limiting resistor um, because the transistor else you will have a lot of power going through the base and then out of the emitter. 
and we need some kind of default state because it's a PNP transistor when it is high it is not allowing any current to pass so we are just having a pull-up resistor which is connected to 5 volts and in a default state this will switch off the transistor and will not allow any power to go through when we have power we are switching or we are putting this way we are putting it low and whenever this is low so when there is power going through here so if this is low this there is power going through now there is a kind of an issue with this circuit is that we have a direct connection from 5 volt to one of the GPIOs. It goes through two resistors but this is not important because the GPIOs have some internal diode protections and if we have even 5 volt connecting to any of the GPIOs it will draw some small amount of power. In our case or in my case this was 2 milliamps. So even if everything is switched off we still draw at least 2 milliamps. We don't want that and for this we are adding so I'm just erasing this line we are adding some other components we're not connecting directly to GPIO here but we have a second transistor and in this case we have a smaller PNP transistor which is connected to ground and this is then connected by the power control whenever we switch this high this will be connected meaning that this will be put low all this will be put to ground and when this is put to ground power will go through but in this case power cannot go through the to the pin because we are using the base and there is no current which can go through the base the current can only go uh, from the base through to the emitter and this is also why we need to add a small resistor here and this is how we can control the power and switch it completely off whenever we need to switch it off or switch it on whenever we need to to continue providing power the other thing we need to do is monitor this kind this shake sensor because we still want to uh, have power running here as long as there is activity or as long as the clapperboard is actually moving we cannot tap directly here because once we enabled power this will be set to 5 volts no matter what this switch does this will be set to 5 volts we need to come with a more clever way to do it and it is what uh, my solution was uh, let's draw this my solution was to add a diode here and a pull down resistor up this is a pull down resistor meaning when there is when this is open this will stay to ground even if there is power going through here because of the diode this there will there will be no current flowing here so this will stay always at ground as long as there is no ac activity whenever there is activity it is switched to 5 volts and this is exactly what we need to to measure only when there is activity this line is 5 volts so this line is now connected to an input pin that's connected to an input pin of the power board which is which we now call, call activity pin and that's all there is to it what we need to do now is put all the circuitry on this clapperboard so this is the cheapest clapperboard I could find this is just wood and it will do the job quite fine here we have all the electronic components we have all the displays with the analog multiplexer we have the buttons to control the number on the displays we have the real-time clock module to show date and time and on this module we also have an EEPROM so we can save the numbers we have a piezoelectric element to buzz the scene and take whenever we clap we have the power control board and in the middle we have the microcontroller board which connects all the elements and controls them this is the clapper board which we will use to put all the components on it's a simple wood clapper board where normally you really have to write everything on top of it but we want to make a digital clapper board here we have the template which shows where we put the displays and the buttons and using the template we can cut out in the board the place to put the displays and the buttons here we've added the displays now we added the buttons 
Here is again the dump plate, this time it's laminated and it's glued on the clapperboard. So we don't see anymore what was originally on the clapperboard, but really what we are displaying on these seven segment displays. This is the back and we can see all the modules with the seven segment displays. We need to add all the other components, being the real-time clock module, the development board, the analog multiplexer, the power board. And instead of having a USB battery, I will have a charger model with battery protection and a step-up voltage booter so we can have five volts. And with some thick cable, I've connected the power on all the modules and with some thinner cable, I've connected all the 16 buttons in a 4x4 matrix. The next step is to connect all the other peripherals, most importantly all the 7 segment displays, but also the clap button and the real-time clock module, and this is now all the connections we need. I've added the battery because now everything is connected, and this was the last missing element. I've put glue on all the connections so the soldering doesn't break that easily. This is the white transparent glue. But I also have black hot glue which I've put on all the cables so the cables don't move too much all around and they stay in place. And that's it. They, these are all the connections and this is quite stable. And if we return we see again the front with all the displays and the buttons. I've also added the buzzer and that's it. Now we can start it and as we can see it works perfectly. I've also added some color filters so I can increase the contrast and we can see the numbers better than on the bare seven segment displays. And with that, the assembly is complete and the clapperboard is ready to be used. And here it is. This is the final version of the, or at least the finished version of the clapperboard. We see the episode, the scene, the take, the date, the time, the video file number and the audio file number. It is a bit dark though green doesn't have a lot of contrast. These two numbers are disabled because I just have one video recorder and one audio recorder. And then we have the buttons to adjust everything. We can still adjust, that works. The buzzer. And that's the back. There are a couple of changes. I'm using, I'm not using a USB power bank. I'm using a lithium ion battery. Here is a battery charger plus battery protection. This is the five volt voltage booster. But except of that, Everything is there. We have the seven displays, the analog multiplexer to choose which display to go to. Um, here the two displays with eight digits, the real-time clock, and the microcontroller. And a lot of cables with glued everything so, so it holds together. And it works. So we had the breadboard version. We have here the physical first prototype. And if I would have to do it again, I would do lay out a real board where I just have to put the seven segments on top of it and some couple of chips and not have to use these modules. But this is a prototype. If I would have to, I would make it professionally, I would change a couple of things. I wouldn't use these TM1637 anymore. I would only use these Max7219 because you can they they speak fast and you can change them. I wouldn't use this RTC module, I would use the embedded RTC here and this would be gone because we don't have this TM1637 uh, anymore. This would be done with SMT devices, this would be a bit more integrated, but yeah, that's for a professional product. For the code for the microcontroller will be available on, on Git and there would be a bit of documentation on the wiki. But else I don't have any plans to provide a board except if there's really a lot of interest then I may lay out and board and produce some boards. But in any other case, enjoy the clapper board.